All right, so we're going to get into chapter four today. We might get through chapter five. We will see how we do. We're going to talk about endocrinology, and this is going to be off of the CSCS fourth edition, page 65. Now, if you start out on, on chapter four, it talks about endocrine response to resistance exercise, and you'll see Dr. Kramer. Dr. Kramer is one of the more well-known exercise physiologists in the industry. He's a professor at The Ohio State, also was a professor at the University of Connecticut, and that's where I got my, uh, that's where I did an internship in 2003, 2004. So I will consider Dr. Kramer one of my uh, mentors. Uh, I am where I'm at today because of him, absolutely. One of the smartest, most humble dudes in the world. And without a doubt, probably one of the biggest influences on periodization and kinesiology on our field in the last 30 years. I've had people, I've gotten A's in classes just because I put him on a resume. So this, this chapter is really in depth getting into the responses from exercise when we are doing certain lifts, whether it be aerobic or anaerobic. So let's just start with the basics on uh, general adaptation syndrome. So when we look at the three responses, technically four responses, we're going to have a, an alarm phase. And then maybe we've seen the, the famous chart for GAS, general adaptation syndrome. So you have an alarm, you have resistance, and then you have adaptation. And then you're going to get super compensation. And so this right here, the exhaustion portion is going to really be from, overtraining is going to be from doing too much, not resting enough, having high amounts of stress, and having low intake. I've only trained a couple of people in my life that have had gone through some type of overtraining. It's really, really hard to do. It's almost like a badge of honor. You will see it in places like CrossFit because the volume is so crazy high. It doesn't mean CrossFit's bad, but you'll just see it more in that environment. You typically don't see it with athletes. Do And why do you think that is? Why do you think we don't see a lot of overtraining with athletes? Anyone? Is it because they have a trainer themselves or like, an, or I don't know. <laughs> I mean, they're more conditioned. Um, it could be the fact that they're working with an expert to dig a little deeper. Well, I mean, to piggyback off that, Rolanda. So if they are working with a coach or they have someone, what is that coach really, really stressing? Post-hab and pre-hab. Yeah, I mean, they're going to they're, they're gonna be having things within their programming that will help with pre-hab or, or post-hab, definitely. Um, I would firsthand working with athletes, you stress sleep, you stress nutrition. And these are things that they prioritize. You have a really good schedule. You wake up at 5 a.m., you go to practice, you have lunch, I'm sorry, breakfast. Everything is very, very structured. So your intake is high, your sleep and recovery is very well. And then you, you do have the programs designed for you. So uh, it's kind of sets the expectations for what general adaptation is. So when it gets into the hormones and the big hormones that we're going to take a look at are going to be um, the big organ, sorry, it would be the, the pituitary gland. They call it the master gland. <clears throat> There's an anterior, intermediate, and posterior aspect of the pituitary gland. Uh, the anterior is, is more relevant on what is being produced within our you know, profession of what we see, at least with testosterone and growth hormone and so forth. The main organs that are communicating with the brain are going to be the adrenal glands, which are on top of the kidneys. And you have two of them. And so your liver is a giant organ. Starts over here on the right side of your rib cages, goes up to your right nipple, comes across to your left side. It's a very, very large organ. And then behind your liver, you have your pancreas. And what hormones are the pancreas release? Two of them. Um, insulin and glucagon. Good. And so they're referred to as antagonistic hormones because when I release insulin, I will take sugar out of my blood. So insulin is an anabolic hormone. It's going to get the glucose molecule. It's going to bring it to a receptor on the other side of the cell. And that receptor is usually like, it's a glute receptor, glute one through 12, typically like a four or five is what we'll see with resistance training. And it's going to take that glucose molecule and it's going to shuttle it out of the bloodstream. 
depending on the environment post-workout, we're going to put it into the liver if it's more aerobic. If it's resistance training, it's going to be more the muscle, the muscle that was being used. If it is uh, an environment where my muscle and liver glycogen is full, then I'll take that glucose and convert it into fat. So it's all dependent on the individual and that environment. So again, just to reiterate, aerobic exercise will be more liver glycogen. Anaerobic exercise, depending on the intensity and what you were doing. So if I just did a full body workout, legs, chest, back, we just designed a upper body program before class. Uh, we did you know chest, back, and shoulders. It's going to take the glycogen, replenish it for your chest, your back, your thighs, your tries, your deltoids, and all the synergistic muscles. The antagonistic hormone would be glucagon. Glucagon breaks down glycogen. So when my blood sugar levels are high, my brain communicates with the pancreas, releases insulin. Insulin will then take the sugar and get it out of the bloodstream. If you've ever gone to a doc, they will, they'll have you test your blood glucose levels in a fast state, typically 12 hours. So you go in there, let's say that your levels are 90. So you, what are some things, and this is a, a tricky question, but we're smart trainers, so we should know this. But what are some things that are going to increase my blood sugar levels? Stress? <laughs> no. Actually, it would decrease because of what cortisol does. It utilizes a lot of glucose. So think of a stressful environment like a, a tire that's full, or even better, a water bottle that has a little hole in the bottom. When we stress, that hole gets bigger. So our blood sugar levels actually drop. Okay. What are things that increase our blood sugar levels? If you're training someone, Yolanda, at the gym and they get a little woozy, what do you give them? Um, carbs. Yeah, you give them specifically yeah. glucose. Yeah. Now, let's be careful with carbs because carbs are essentially two categories. Sugar and what's the other category? Um, protein, fat. No, 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 no. We're looking at just carbs. It's under the umbrella of carbohydrates. So we have sugar, which are monosaccharides, disaccharides, polysaccharides. Then we Art have food? fiber. I don't know. What was that? Oh, I said starches. But... Yeah, so you, you're getting there. You're close enough with, with right. fiber. So fiber is not going to increase, increase your blood sugar levels, but your monosaccharides and your disaccharides will. So that's going to be your fructose, glucose, and lactose, of which glucose will have the, the, the largest effect. But there's also another macronutrient, specifically something that will increase your blood sugar levels as well. And what is that? Fat. Nope. Yeah. And we got one more. It's not alcohol either. Protein. Yep. And specifically, what amino acid increases your blood sugar levels? Leucine. Leucine is a branch chain amino acid. We have leucine, valine, and isoleucine. Uh, whey protein has a fairly significant increase in your blood sugar levels. Interestingly enough, you know, the bro science, like, oh, you got to get your carbs after workout to replenish your, and, you know, insulin get jacked. But protein, uh, you don't even need carbs post-exercise if you get a pure enough source of whey protein that will have an anabolic effect with the release of insulin. And then we have the adrenal glands, which will be releasing our uh, uh, stress hormones, specifically glucose. And then you're going to have your adrenaline that will be released as well. Liver will produce IGF, which is insulin growth like factors. Those are anabolic hormones. So you have within on top of, so the adrenals would look like this. Here's my kidney, obviously not this big. Your adrenals will be on top. You have the cortex and the medulla. The cortex is going to be producing cortisol. Think of C for cortex and cortisol. Medulla is going to be the fight or flight. The fight or flight hormones are going to be adrenaline, noradrenaline. And then obviously your testes will be producing testosterone. But how about for ladies? Where do ladies produce testosterone? Your adrenal glands. So the question that they may ask you for the CSCS, it would be based off of pancreas, the adrenal glands, and 
if looking up here with the, uh, this is table 4.1, looking at the anterior pituitary gland and the release of like LH, luteinizing hormone, or FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, uh, like a curveball they would ask about uh, renin, which is, has to do with your kidneys and regulating optimal kidney health. I would just star those ones on this table. That will help you. They're not going to get too in-depth. Again, maybe just a couple for the hormone aspect. <clears throat> All right, so then we move along into, like they're not going to get into like the, the, the classification and the, the turnkey. Actually, turnkey is um, has a business term. Lock and key theory is what they use. Uh, they're not going to ask about like the peptide stuff and the different hormones. So you can skip all that. Um, the next thing, that this is going to be good to know, be on page 74 and 75. So how much testosterone will we be releasing is going to depend on how large the muscle is. So I can clap before this class, we're going over programming, why it's important to train a multi-jointed chest exercise before a single jointed chest exercise, like a chest fly, is because of the tension that's going to be put and allowed for a multi-joint exercise, like a bench press, and the stimulation of the muscle fibers from the load will have a larger impact on testosterone release than like an isolation. So the, uh, the muscle that's being used, the size of it, and also the joints will play a role in how much you're, you're going to be releasing. So on page 75, you'll see talks about large muscle groups. The resistance is important. So at least 85%, that's going to be closer to five reps. So one to five is going to be optimal. Uh, moderate to high volume. And then uh, short rest intervals, like three seconds to one minute. So this is kind of a cool thing to hypothesize when you look at optimizing testosterone release. And is there going to be a long-term chronic effect with the hormonal adaptations that's still being currently studied? We're indifferent on that answer. Meaning if you have, say, the, the typical units would be 300 to 1,200 for a male units per deciliter, 30 to 90 for a female. If your levels were, say, 500 for a dude, strength training regularly wouldn't bump it up to 600. They're still indifferent on if that is for certain or not. But we do know there's an acute effect. And that acute effect will have an impact on, you know, your mindset and just how you carry yourself. So that's one of the benefits of uh, resistance training, specifically heavy outside of that first month. So you could take typically take like a, a five rep max. A five rep max would be 85% with zero reps in reserve. So you could do one rep and then rest a minute and then do another rep and then rest a minute and then do another rep. And so then you could just do this until you fatigue out. And this would be an interesting way to determine if you have more type one or type two muscle fibers in that area. Uh, so that's just a fun little thing that you can experiment with yourself on with your training. <clears throat> Growth hormone, how we release that will be on 79, looking at the different types of resistance training. Uh, typically volume will have the biggest impact on growth hormone. And then you will not release insulin based off of resistance training. Cortisol is a stress hormone and exercise is a form of stress. Uh, testosterone and cortisol are typically, uh, you can see a linear approach with resistance training. So as cortisol goes up, so will testosterone. And that's why it's important to be mindful of this resting state of the individual food consumption, because if you're training for longer than 60 minutes, if we have this parallel increase due to intensity, cortisol will keep on going up. Testosterone will peak out about 60 minutes. So it's going to dip down. So if you want to keep your cortisol levels in check within reason, having some type of intra shake or um, our RD that we have on these calls uh, she talks about applesauce. I think that's a great suggestion. So if I like getting the little Mott's applesauce things, I have them in my, my cabinet. If you go do you know, a two hour workout, carry one of those and just halfway and just chug it back. It's going to be 30 to 40 grams of carbs. And that will be enough to replenish enough muscle, muscle, muscle glycogen, whereas you're not going to be degrading your muscle protein. So what that means is you're not going to be breaking down muscle as a fuel source. Now, if you didn't have that intra shake or that, uh, the carbs, what you would find is as much as 20%, maybe even higher of 
the fuel during the workout would be protein. That's exactly what you don't want. You'd essentially just be losing all, out on all your gains. So they talk a little bit about resistance training and cortisol. So really the, the page that you really want to know a lot of, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a benefit, benefit for, um, for long resistance or not resistance um, events like that. Page 85. This is really the, the one that you want to memorize. This is a really good chart just to, to check out. So how athletes can manipulate endocrine system response with resistance training. So generally, it's going to be the more fibers that are recruited, the greater the potential for the release. Um, the increase in testosterone is going to be mainly large muscles, heavier weight, moderate to high volume, a short rest, whereas growth hormone will be more of like your 10 plus reps. Think of German volume training. That was you know, 10 sets of 10 with one minute rest periods, a lot of volume. That's going to be releasing a lot of growth hormone. Um, so the big thing for growth hormone would just be the volume aspect in one minute rest periods. That's the big thing that you need to know for the endocrine aspect. Any questions on hormones or anything along that line? In the study guide, we have some good questions in there. Take those and come back with any questions that you have about those questions. You can look at the end of the textbook and there's a good five questions in here just to piggyback off of this last one. So which of the following hormones has the greatest influence on neural changes? On neural changes, that's gonna be testosterone. Testosterone is directly related to having a positive effect on the, the neural aspect. The answer is not BOSU or stability balls. I mean, that's not one of the questions, but uh, testosterone had the greatest impact there. <clears throat> What type of resistance training workouts promotes the highest growth hormone increase following exercise? So again, higher volume, moderate sets, so like three to six, uh, moderate rest periods, uh, 30 seconds to a minute. So that would be A. <clears throat> and let's take a look at one more. Which of the following is not a function of growth hormone? So increases lipolysis. Lipolysis is the breakdown of a lipid, which it does increases amino acid transport. So growth hormone will help with that, which is breaking down your amino acids. Decrease glucose utilization. It definitely does have an impact on that. And the correct answer would be it doesn't um, decrease collagen synthesis. So growth hormone increases that. So you're only gonna get three questions on the CSCS. So we would ask essentially, uh, increases amino acid transport, decreases collagen synthesis, increases lipolysis. Just remember, they, if you don't know in the bodybuilding world, do you know what the nickname for growth hormone is? Anyone? What they call it? They call it the fountain of youth because when you take it, your body just feels amazing. And when does your body naturally feel amazing? after you get a good night's rest. And that's when we produce the most amount of growth hormone. You will get a lot when you go through puberty. You will get a decent amount when you fast. Still uncertain with the evidence, the efficacy of having elevated glucose levels because in that, in that environment, uh, growth hormones are, in that environment during fasting, growth hormone is actually catabolic. It will break down, as it says right here, uh, increases lipolysis. So it's breaking down fat but it helps with just rebuilding a tissue. So it increases collagen synthesis. All right, let's take a look at, what we got here? This would be good. Actually, we'll power through this one. You guys have any questions on anything so far? All right, so let's take a look.